Uh, food security is, is a, a problem in Australia and I think it's a problem that's been swept under the carpet. And it's not just a new problem that's been swept under the carpet because I can remember back in the 1970s when I actually did a lot of the uh, legwork for the Henderson Poverty Inquiry, it was an issue then. But people have ignored it uh, all through this, this whole time. So it is a problem that people don't acknowledge and it's been played down, as Liz said, in the National Food Plan. I was fairly annoyed when I saw figures of 5% and in the presentation that I attended, was uh, they were talking about really only 2.8% and I was sort of uh, somewhat annoyed about that. I refuse to use the word 5% to, to talk about it because I think it makes much, it f seems much stronger if you talk about 1.1 million people. That's a lot of people, whereas 5% the National Food Plan made out that most of Australia was very well fed and you didn't need to worry about this because it was only 5%. So I'd rather talk in numbers rather than percentages because of the number of people. I think it's also important to realise that most of these people uh, or at least live in urban areas. Uh, they're not remote and shouldn't be forgotten. I think when you look at the National Food Plan, it not only said it was 5%, it did say it was higher than that in remote uh, communities of Aboriginal communities but once people put it into that basket they sort of put that into the too hard basket and ignore it and I think that whole idea is to marginalize the people who are suffering from from food insecurity is a big problem so when we look at uh, people who complain that they're doing it tough in Australia ma the majority of the people who make the most noise about doing it tough are not really doing it all that tough I mean, they're really just complaining that the carbon price is going to add a little bit to the electricity cost for running their air conditioners, uh, whereas the families that are food insecure really are doing it tough. Um, so they're the people who, they may not be starving in Australia, in, indeed many of them are, are overweight, but they are people who experience food insecurity because they don't know necessarily where their next meal is coming from. And many, of course, um, have to miss meals, as we've heard today in the Anglicare report, through lack of money. From a nutritional viewpoint, food security often goes hand in hand with poor diets. And when you're not sure where you, your next meal is coming from, your main concern is to get some kilojoules into you. You just basically want something that's going to fill your belly uh, and it's not going to be salad. You're going to go for chips, not carrots. I mean, really, if you don't know where you're going to get after this meal, you want to make sure that what you have <coughs> is going to be as filling as possible. <coughs> and so many of those people who are food insecure uh, really don't choose the best kind of foods, but I think what their choices are understandable. So, I mean, I would maintain that not all healthy foods cost more. If you look at home brand rolled oats, it costs about 10 cents for a reasonable size serving, which is a lot less than you pay for Cocoa Pops. Uh, legumes are cheap. And frankly, if I was suddenly poor, we already use the home brand rolled oats, but if I was suddenly poor, I'd be cooking up some chickpeas and things. But I've got the skills and the knowledge and the time to do that, and many people don't. So that um, we really do need to, to look at people and not just sort of moralise about how they could be doing better. Because when your life is one long stress and you're concerned mainly with finding shelter and similar necessities for your kids, cooking legumes doesn't come to, to be top priority. When I've asked those people on limited incomes, including the cooks who are often given many minimum amounts of money to feed people in nursing homes and institutions, what would you do if you actually had more money? What would you buy more of? They all have a single answer and that is fruit. They all say I'd buy more fruit if I had more money. So that is certainly something that people are not buying. As a nutritionist, of course, I'd like to encourage people to eat more vegetables and more fresh fish and more nuts and leaner cuts of meat and leaner cuts of chicken if that's what they're eating. But really poor people can't afford those items. And as wealthier people have chosen to pay more for lean meat, the fat has been cut off and put into other foods. So it goes into the sausage meat and it goes into the frozen burgers and those cheaper things, which of course are what people who have very little money to spend on food are going to buy. We then say, why are these people eating so much fat? Well, they're eating so much fat because they are the cheaper foods on the whole. Um, and so we see then that many of these people actually become overweight. And that leads some people to moralise and say, well, if they haven't got enough food, how can they be overweight? The two things actually go very closely together because the cheaper foods are usually the sorts of foods that are more likely to make people fat. And that sets up a chain of events. 
So once you then have overweight, you're more likely to have high blood pressure, you have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, which then increases your risk of coronary heart disease. And of course, there are a number of conditions that are related to that. Among children, which is where I've had a lot of concern over the years, if they don't have enough nutritious foods, some of them may be under undernourished and very thin, or they may be undernourished and quite overweight. But undernutrition is a real problem for these kids. A great many of these kids go to school without any breakfast. And there have been many breakfast programs that have been startled at the number of children who come from poor families where there is no breakfast at home. Now, if you haven't had breakfast, you're much less likely to be able to concentrate in school, which means you then have set up that chain of events that you are much more likely to have behavioural problems and learning problems, and then everyone picks at you because you're not doing well, and so you might as well live up to the reputation that you've gained. So it is all a problem. So I'm keen to sort of look at some of these problems. We really have to look at some of the factors um, that our food choices are based on if we're going to make any sort of changes. Now the main reason, and this was an article that appeared in Nutrition Reviews just today, it was a nice article because it had some nice referenced uh, information. The most important factor people consider is the taste of food, followed closely by affordability, then convenience and variety, and right at the bottom is health. So I think that if we start saying, why don't you all just choose healthy foods, we're not going to get anywhere. That's not the way people are choosing their foods. So it's a bit hard for a nutritionist to acknowledge that, but we really do have to look at taste and affordability and convenience, particularly for people who are in these fairly dire circumstances where healthy food is really not um, pro a top priority. So if we look at the essential needs for coping with food security, I think we obviously need skills and education. That's uh, fairly obvious. Skills are essential, and I think they need to be taught in primary school. Uh, they can, teaching food technology in high school gets you nowhere. It's way too late. And skills can be taught through uh, some sort of modified kitchen garden program that the Commonwealth Department of Health has had grants for for uh, the Stephanie Alexander School Kitchen Garden Program. It's probably too fancy for many areas, but we would like governments to fund some of those other, perhaps um, at a lesser level. Community gardens do wonders, and this can be helped, the funding for this can come from local government um, or from state governments. And the advantage of people having access to a garden is that they eat the healthy foods without you having to ever mention the word health. So they, they just automatically choose things. And there are now about a dozen studies which show that where people have access to things that are grown, their diets are greatly improved. And there are a number of these studies that have been done in schools and the children's concentration levels and everything else about them improves. So education is always important, but I think we have to be really careful that we don't just fall into the trap of saying they must be educated. Now, a fellow called Professor John Coveney from Flinders University once gave one of the most brilliant talks I've ever heard on which he called, they must be educated, because he said it doesn't matter what it is, the problem is, we just sort of sit up on our high horses and say, they must be educated. Education is important, but it's not going to do it on its own. Understanding is important as well. And I think this is where we need to sort of, um, I actually, I mentioned that I was involved in the 1970s um, poverty inquiry and that was a real turning point for me. I came from a middle class home. I, didn't come, I hadn't come across people who didn't have enough money for food. The people in that study were all people with four kids who'd been to the Smith family at the day, wanting help and wanting some food, help with food. And the last uh, 90 people that my students that were working for me couldn't chase, I actually put the baby I had at the time, which was child number three, I think, on the hip and went and looked for them myself. And I came to one place and a woman said to me, the children were eating the most appalling foods. They were eating broken up chocolate biscuits dunked into sweetened condensed milk. Their teeth were horrible and looked horrible. And I was sort of quite appalled at this. And she must have seen me looking sort of somewhat askance at what they were eating. And she said, she said, it's all right for all you people. She said, if your kids need a new bike or they need to go and play sport or they need to go and do something, you can do it for them. She said, I can't do that for my kids. The one thing I can do is let them eat whatever they like. And I, I actually thought, I've, I've never forgotten that, because I thought I had come in with an attitude that, how can you do this terrible thing to give your kids this terrible diet? Whereas to her, it was one thing 
that she could actually relate to her children with. And I, I thought that's something that we probably need to understand, that understanding. So we, we need to understand the forces that encourage poor selection of foods. And one of those forces, of course, is the aggressive marketing of foods. And all of us are pushed towards buying products that bring in the most product for food companies. And marketing is based on the four Ps, product, price, promotion and placement. The product, we now have literally thousands of poor quality products loaded with sugars and cheap starches, lots of salt, the wrong kind of fat, and very little uh, adequate labelling to enable people to choose those unless they're going to stand in the supermarket and read labels for a long time. And if you've ever shopped with some small kids in tow, you simply can't do that. So we need that, and the federal government is working on something at the moment. Uh, and I'm part of that, that group, but we're having some problems in getting the thing across. The price of foods, the cheaper foods, are, tend to be the junkier foods. Promotion of foods, we really, I think, have to stand and keep pushing to stop the advertising of foods when kids are watching television. Now, what the food industry did was say, well, we won't have so much advertising during children's television programs. But there's a very small audience for those programs. Most kids do not watch television between four and six. They watch television between six and nine. And they, of course, won't do anything about that. So that is a problem. Placement is also a problem. It's a, pl it's a problem because local councils need to take some action to stop having so many fast food outlets. And many of you are aware of the studies that have been done in Western Sydney that show the much higher um, uh, number of fast food outlets in those areas. We, it's harder to do something about supermarkets, but we could all complain because the products that are the junkier products are always put where the little kids sitting in the shopping trolley will see them and exert some pester power. Easy access to healthy foods um, is also important, and that's again another area where I think we can look at local councils, we can look at departments of education, we can look at the school and community kitchen gardens. And the final point I want to talk about, of course, is that we need to make sure people have sufficient money um, so that they can buy better. Now, that's a long-term effort that we need to make to governments, and we're going backwards at the moment, I think, that to, to sort of push governments to have adequate incomes. Uh, they need to be accom accompanied by an increased skills and knowledge base, and they're all initiatives that need careful planning. I think in the meantime, before we can get to that adequate income, we could at least push governments to look at using vouchers for discounts on fruit and vegetables. This is something people can do without feeling too embarrassed. It's just when they get to the checkout, they've got a voucher, which means their fruit and vegetables are, are cheaper. That could be done quite quickly. I personally would like to see it funded by taxing the junk food, uh, but I've been pushing for that for about 40 years and I'll probably have to keep going till um, well, I haven't got another 40 years left, I don't think, unless I was extremely old. Um, but I do think that we need to sort of um, push for, for that, for some interim measures such as discounts on fruit and vegetables. This could extend not only to when people are buying the product ready to take home to prepare or to eat, but also to foods that are provided in, in public institutions, workplace canteens, so that if we could have discounts on some of the healthier items, and the article I mentioned that occurred in, in, uh, was in Nutrition Reviews today, looked at how effective it is at getting people, particularly poorer people, to choose healthier products if they get a price discount on those products. And it, even if the price discount comes out for, from vouchers or for some sort of discount for a short time, it introduces the people to those products and they keep buying it even when the discount is no longer there. So there are some issues that I think we can look at. And the, of course, there are many things that we need to do about not wasting food and about a lot of other things that I'm sure our other speakers are going to talk about. So I'm not. But thank you for in inviting me. But thank you, most of all, for organising uh, these sorts of issues. This has now spread. The Public Health Association, of which I'm a member, has been very keen on food security for some time. But I was thrilled this week to discover that the Dietitians Association had actually put out a media release about the importance of food security. So you're spreading it. It didn't start with those people. It started uh, with some other people. And it's been going for a long while, but we really need to, to move on. So I'll be very interested to hear what our uh, next speakers have to say. Uh, and um, hopefully there'll be some good questions. Thank you.